Welcome everyone to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host, and this is Bad Batch Report, where we are covering all the episodes of The Bad Batch and uh, yeah, season three. And with me to cover all of season three's episodes is... Your husband, it's me, Kyle. <laughs> I was going to introduce you, but I know, okay, I just jump in. Yeah, uh, people have enjoyed... I figured we could take a different approach. Uh, what's that? Oh, wait, that's the name of the episode. <laughs> and and our introduction. <laughs> and the return. <laughs> the return of Kyle continues. Uh, so this is for episode four and five, A Different Approach and The Return. Yep. Here we yep. are. Here we two are. Two weeks later. Yeah. So I've decided to group them together into kind of groups of two until we get to closer to the end of the season. Definitely wasn't an active choice. No, <laughs> because we both came down with a crazy flu well by this it was a head cold really well okay fine but i had shakes so i wasn't recording and my voice was crap and uh you were in the throes and depth of it i was still fine wednesday more or less right 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 right. it was wednesday night when i was like i can't think straight or do anything anymore but i wrote some great wednesday afternoon during that last week (laughs) notes notes (laughs) That because I then got sick and I'm only just barely recovered. Right. I was like, I don't remember saying or writing these things. So, <laughs> so you're benefiting from. I, yep. You get past the, Kyle. You best and most beautiful Kyle reading things past Kyle knew and present Kyle barely recalls. Any thoughts overall on these two episodes? Again, overall on the two episodes, they don't... I had thought that they would hang together Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, more mm -hmm. cleanly. I realize that within the pipeline of the whole Bad Batch and Lucasfilm animation group, that's never going to happen. They would literally need to be named part one, part two Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in order for that to occur. They, they both are telling their own unique, distinct story that has its own beats and place and time. And right. they while they do chronologically follow each other, they don't directly follow each other. And I'm disappointed by that. Oh. Because it, they ended a different approach with such a, an, a, an interesting and strong conclusion that made you want to know what was going to happen next. We didn't get the conflict and we don't get it at all. No, we got the conflict in a different way in the next episode. It's also uh, not but the, it, yeah. it it was just done in a different way and symbolically to me it's stronger than just having them fight or disagree or yap at each other when they meet or Yeah, but I know. would like that emotional tension. Oh, we yeah. didn't really get it. It ends there just as the tension is about to but be at revealed. its peak, we don't get any of the payoff of the conflict brother to brother. Yeah. Right? No, I I hear you. Um, there is something that I that I have been thinking a lot about with regards to these two episodes, which is that there is a lot of animal uh guides, <laughs> animal symbolism in these two episodes and I was shocking I uh, when I was looking back on them overall that was the main thing that um that I mainly that I mainly noticed and that there is also for a different approach especially it is a return from the underworld journey right so they haven't quite gotten out of the underworld it's the return aspect of it and it ends up really nailing down something I've talked about in the first two seasons, which is how anti-patriarchal these stories are in Omega continuously reminding Crosshair that she doesn't want him to go back to his old ways. She doesn't want him to go back to being violent, but then also understanding that sometimes to defend other people, a wise man who is anti-patriarchal must use violence to protect and defend others. And this show shows anti-patriarchy so well. Mm -hmm. That's all. (laughs) That's that's specifically to a different approach. Oh, yes, absolutely. Because that that doesn't hark as much. I mean, there's more animals in in the The animals overall. Yeah. Animals overall for both episodes. But that's Star Wars in general. They've really in the Disney era especially like cute animals or animals that you identify with that's that's way heavier than it has ever been and uh 
they also like kind of like kaiju large crazy creatures <laughs> they always yeah. like those too but uh and of course serpents and worms are really big in in the second episode but we'll get to that it was just more animals overall between the two episodes and i'll get into what those mean specifically as we go through them but a different approach anti-patriarchal same as the rest of the show but really really shows it well there's some confusing things happening in a different approach oh yeah <laughs> i will just go out and say that right now one what the hell is the economy on this planet, let alone the economy of credits? <laughs> if you can walk away with 45,000 credits from just a few rounds of Sabak, starting with nothing. Remember, right. it was 10,000 credits. She lied. She thought... She, like, sure, she, she starts yeah. with nothing. I know. Zero credits. I know. <laughs> and ends up with 45,000. And isn't a speeder like... I don't know, but like I just from like, the sh- sp- I was just going to say the movies, Tatooine. <laughs> the movies, yeah, it was ten thousand credits to fly them from Tatooine to Alderaan. Yeah, half now, half when they get there. Yeah, and this princess better be worth it. That right. was ten thousand credits, and it seemed like a lot. She made that in a ha- ra- hand and a, a half, a half an hour, and he and she, used him to bribe him off too. <laughs> she paid that kid, I know, five thousand credits. <laughs> To tell them something they probably already knew. And like that's the most of the price of a speeder, because that's I, that's I, Luke's speeder. I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't the the economy, but maybe things are shifting because of Trebuchet Rampart's new credit system that he I brought in. I can only hope. <laughs> uh, I will say the street urchin is played by Meg Marchand. And okay. Meg Marchand was a former production assistant in season one. So this is her like one of her first voice acting <laughs> gigs. Nice. I was really happy to see it. And then here's the interesting thing, because I watched it right in the like in the early afternoon, right. late lunch time, sitting there eating a bowl of soup, trying not to think about getting sick and watching this episode. <laughs> and I'm I at the end when the credits roll, her name is right there. But then when I go to check IMDb, she's not there. Oh. She wasn't added to IMDb until Friday. Oh, interesting. So I was like, who who is responsible for updating IMDb? Cuz <laughs> uh yourself, I think. I think you have to log oh. like like the, the Is sh- it like Wikipedia? It's sort of, it, I think so. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, I don't know. I you know, maybe I'm wrong. Um Okay, so... What do you I, have to say about the episode first? Uh, well, I just want to jump in with okay. a couple of the other voice actors, because this episode had a whole bunch right. when The Return had didn't had three people. So, I don't... And a worm. Which was voiced by somebody. So, um, <laughs> th- this is a really cool episode, because do you know who voices Batcher? Is it... Is it D? It's D. Bradley Baker. Of course it is. I I literally have been thinking about this since watching the live action Avatar The Last Airbender, how good he is at doing animal voices like Appa yeah. and Momo and all of the animals that are in the cartoon Avatar. And I was like, oh, I wonder if D did the cartoon or did the live action. No, he's too busy with Bad Batch. So uh, <laughs> absolutely. I, yeah, I'm so happy he's doing an animal again. He kind of has to, though, right? Yeah, because Batcher's does, part of the Batch. He does every voice in the Bad Batch. Yeah, and except for Omega. Bad, is Batcher not part of the Bad Batch? Yes, Bad ba- Batcher is part of the Bad Batch. Then, therefore, he has to do the voice. But he also does Commander Scorch in this episode, which I listened to it again, and I could not tell. I, lis- I went back knowing that he was the voice of Commander Scorch. I went back to listen to it again could not tell that's amazing really well done like he's amazing. so good he's so talented so good um and then one of the other characters in the show is harry lloyd um he does one of the other characters and harry lloyd as i, I whispered to you on the couch at one point here he actually is the actor who did viserys targaryen in season one of game of thrones with right. the crown of <laughs> crown of gold he's in this episode too and he's exactly the guy you hate like, yeah it's just so well done um there's so many things I liked about this episode and we're absolutely confused by the economy of it. <laughs> yes. I literally wrote puffs of cold air breath. Bartender droid was so cool in design. Three Eastern stars? Question mark. I have no idea how currency works anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's fair. I think it just works at the speed of the plot, much like light speed. 
right? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, ah, oh, what do you need? <laughs> we need some light speed skipping with currency here so we can get, <laughs> so we can get around what we need. And then they just end up stealing the ship anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, they crash on this planet as they have escaped mm-hmm. Tantis and, uh, and the planet there. And this planet is actually called Lau, which I thought was kind of interesting. It's a good name. Um, Omega really, really wants to retain the coordinates of Tantis so that they can make it back there and then they can go and rescue all of the clone troopers, um, which, you know, is something that's heavily on her mind to go back and rescue them. But Crosshair's like, nah, you know, we can't stay. They're going to be here any moment. You can't go back for that. Exactly. Information. He also, as they start to... um go into the town he also like doesn't want batcher there either (laughs) right right so it's like it's it's a continuous thing with him for this whole episode and and even like really his hesitancy to do more to rescue others and that's kind of the a major thing that he has to get over over these two episodes um it's really interesting i read a great article that really summarized some of the things as to why it's called a different approach and that crosshair's perspective in this this episode is that he's willing to let omega lead yeah omega omega got him here Okay, let's see what Omega. She's advising a different course, a different approach to what he would choose, mm-hmm. and he's he is more than willing to be second fiddle to that. And and when it doesn't led, work out, yeah. or, or he, his approach is the one that's needed in the end, there isn't an "I told you so." Mm-hmm. It's just grim efficacy from him. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's definitely really good. And even then, he. He leans into what Omega wants, which is also really good. Um, we get a brief hemlock scene with kind of like the hemlock hand scene. You mean like it just seems to be <laughs> more of the focus is on his hand than anything else nowadays. <laughs> oh my hand! Why are you in the Michael Jackson glove? Oh my god! I right? saw a crazy picture. Have you seen this picture that somebody did of have hemlock taking his glove off, and it's like Professor Quirrell from the first season, first episode of Harry <laughs> Potter, and he's got part of the Emperor in his hand with an eye looking around. Oh my god, that would be amazing! I would actually love that. I would love that. That would be amazing. It's so creepy. Uh, it, like just fan art that's amazing it has to it has be. to I don't be think it would be but uh nala say is still protecting omega and claims it was uh the m count transition was just a false positive yep i mean we get false positives all the time that's my best nala say i mean your neck is not nearly long enough oh you have a nice long neck it's just you get false positives all the time you're not sad and depressed enough. Sorry. So, um, <laughs> Fine. Maybe one day. Maybe. <laughs> Stay married to you. No, just kidding. <laughs> oh. We've been married for a very long time. That was a that was a joke. Back to your blood lab. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I need you to. I need you to clone some more pickled snokes. Um, oh yeah. So the. They're on the run, and uh, of course, Crosshair has mentioned he, he doesn't like Batcher coming along. Hmm. But um, I think it's really important to talk about why Batcher is important. Do you know why Batcher is important? Well, I mean, he's from the audience's perspective. If people are good to Batcher, then we will appreciate those people, and anyone who's not good to Batcher, we will be mad at those people. So that's yeah, right there. That that reason on its own. Um, yeah, I think he'll also. He needs to do some good old digging in the next episode. Oh, he's, so we got to keep very him around for that. that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but dogs are often companions of gods and heroes in that they play an, uh, uh, an important role as being a psychopomp guide to them so that they can transit, they can go between spirit worlds, uh, the this world and the next. And specifically, Batcher plays as a animal companion and guide to Omega. Um, their animals are often used in Star Wars this way. We kind of think about um, the Convery um, owl that falls around Ahsoka. Um, and There's a Wookiee that falls around Han Solo. <laughs> yeah. No, Han Solo is his pet. You think about their lifespans. <laughs> uh, I love that he's the littlest batch so member. So wait, if we get a turtle, yes, 
we're essentially the turtle's pet. Absolutely. Well, wouldn't you want to be a turtle's pet? The turtle, from that perspective? I mean, kind of. <laughs> Multi-generational pet family. Uh, I don't want to make it sad when I die. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I love that he's the littlest batch member. And then that's important when he, he is stolen because he represents more than just a pet, but actually like like a part of her so kind of like how in D D you have a familiar that's that's what batcher is for omega symbolically uh going forward which is really great yeah and and then also requiring crosshair to to invest in the animal as well right because he's part but this this is a packaged deal yeah. now and uh and really really important uh but omega's smart and finds clothes for them to hide because she's like we uh we look like prisoners <laughs> we look like we don't belong here so they uh steal clothing uh classic style yep and uh crosshair offers uh a final solution <laughs> or a, a violent solution option to get them off planet he does. He offers actually three times. There's a lot right. of threes in this where he makes the violent solution three times. It's actually the fourth time he offers violence that it's that's the cho- that's the choice that she takes. Mm-hmm, they, mm-hmm. they go with violence, and um, it ends up being in an effort to protect others. Yeah, and yeah. Re- rescuing a whole bunch of others as mm-hmm, well. Mm-hmm, right, like mm-hmm. a whole bunch of life is freed in the choice to commit to violence. Yeah. So. Um, but it's about it's again this is the hard thing about like anti-patriarchy it's not hard but it's that you know sometimes there's no way to avoid violence but you have to hope that it's in the way that is you've chosen the wise way or the way that is to defend others it was so interesting to see and i'm sad that he's dead this very prone to graft and willing to be bribed imperial officer oh yeah yeah we do not see that very often that is an uncommon thing oh you mean like the spaceport person right yeah yeah like 30 30, 000 yeah i'll just take that fine and i'll just bet you in sabak that was such a different sort of oh you mean during the the credit winning scene or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. Well, yeah he's yeah, that yeah, guy yeah, that's yeah. the guy throughout right he's the one in charge mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. commander scorch and is that his name that's his oh, name man. commander scorch um i did i they're playing a new game called balan oh it wasn't sabak no how and did it, you know that because of wikipedia because i oh, googled okay because it definitely gave me more to do like i was like if this is sabak this is really blown open what sabak is no it was a brand new game and the only reference to it it was from this episode wow and it's okay ca- it's called balan and it has 30 cards in total and it's sort of a betting game yeah it definitely seemed like there yeah. were three different numbers involved and there's mm-hmm. and that's where i was like the three eastern suns what I was very confused. I love that, like, it's obvious in a new game to Omega. It's not something that she's played before, like Sabak or whatever. It's that M count. And she's just really good at it. It's like she's good at games and strategy the way Hunter is good at hunting, the way Wrecker is good at opening doors, the way that Crosshair is sort of good at shooting (laughs) Yeah, not people of long distance. Yeah, she that's kind of like her special ability is literally like cheating people at cards um but uh yeah commander scorch commander scorch is a total like imperial jerk you know in the classical sense like he comes off that way but he does not behave no in a classical he's very tricksy he reminded me a lot of like the sheriff of nottingham in yeah, a way right like, like abuse of power abuse of that power. has been granted to him by this autocracy this yeah this tyrannical military right that, that, that the emperor has built around him to protect himself and now we have this guy operating a completely different level from what we normally see in a star warsian perspective for these military figures who are typically hamstrung by their their military rule right? right yeah they're usually not as underhanded as this right like, right this not... this felt very like 
he was uh, he had many tricks in his bag all the fines in the world yeah yeah very much a sheriff of nottingham and, sort of and character. like like tricking her to be like oh that dog is distracting me and then having his men like vamoose with the dog while she right. was distracted and then taking money from her and then oh my god he's just like get all of his money back and then some yeah like yeah. oh man yeah he, so he he was really interesting um yeah so batcher is stolen and omega convinces crosshair uh to go after him and they she agrees like okay we can't do things the way i was doing them let's do things your way but we also should free all these other captured animals and so it brings back this idea of the clone trooper rebellion that is always on her mind yep. and wanting to free those people whatever from prisoners she can whatever prisoners she can she's always wanting to do that and that ties into kind of more of what she represents which is this freedom from from being subjected and imprisoned and controlled which she represents that for the batch but also in general she's always that's like always her message she's always yeah. on brand i just want to go back to that bar again because we we haven't gotten a lot of that this season it's right. been very stark and very few characters on the screen at mm. any given time. And here we got this Good old whole cantinas are like world, this whole yeah. environment and story that's being told all on its own with this droid bartender and all the other components of it. I really, really liked this bar. I felt like I wanted to go there and play <laughs> this new not Sabak game that I thought was a new version of Sabak. I'm so glad it wasn't. Um, but when we get to the animals erupting, it got really confusing because I was starting to lose what animals were what. And, mm, when I would and it was pause, sort of dark. It was like, dark. Yeah. It was moving so quickly. And I understood we weren't supposed to get an understanding of what all of these animals were. Just that this, this group of Imperials was rounding up animals to be shipped somewhere, to be to have so, something done with. Yeah, like more experimentation perhaps. I don't or, doubt. Like that seems to be a big theme this this season uh, and last season and the whole time is like... Yep. <sighs> yeah. And um, so Crosshair is unleashed and can I, for one of the first times this season... <gasps> death Count! Yes. Death Count! Would you like Death Count? Yeah, let's do Death <laughs> Count for this face. season. You look so excited. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Yeah. Four stormtroopers die from blaster fire. Oh, wow. Okay. Four people get trampled. Oh, man. They might not be dead. They might just have been trampled. One money grubbing evil guy dies to a baby Zilla beast consumption. I can only imagine Are that was sure a baby it... Zilla beast. Oh, but I thought it could have been. Um, oh, the creatures from TFA with the tentacles and the. Yeah, the it could ball. easily have been. Oh, really? I, th I felt it was like more longer tentacles. Which the Zilla Beast has. Any, anyway, so some I long mean, tentacled, which I would have want, wanted to call the baby Zilla Beast. Zilla Beasts are so rare, though. So that's why I was like, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I kind of, yeah, whatever. A tentacle monster. And then one, I am, okay. I think I watched this guy get thrown off that building seven times when the. I literally have a note. Trooper blown off tower. <laughs> so funny. I don't exactly remember what happens because I didn't rewatch the episode I today. I watched it seven times, Marie Claire. <laughs> it's the afterburners kick on and he gets blown right, right? off the building. No, that's what happens. It's so a, funny. And it's not a Wilhelm scream. It's nah. a whole new scream, all of its own. It is a fantastic scream. I hope to hear more of it. If we have not heard lots of it already, if we could have. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things, but it is such a great because they take off right and then right? it's like and he's like, like ah! Ah! <laughs> yeah no oh it was God. great it was great it, i could have watched it seven times we're saying he died right like that's yes no okay how, yeah, could, yeah, you, how yeah. could he have lived yeah. from that he got flung right off the top of he the died. building um after being like essentially push burned by the ship's engines i don't think he lived okay so that's fair if we count Total. all of those people mm -hmm. that adds up to 10 10 humans so you, this episode you you look back to when uh the bad batch was introduced and these death counts are really low well if you think <laughs> about it the death the bad batch was introduced during the clone wars no i know i know the clone wars are done and so death count is not as relevant the 
these episodes are not about the horrors of war. No, they're about coming home from war. Right? Yeah. And no, how absolutely. do you come home from war? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I, I miss Death Count. Well, there you are. Death Count. We didn't. I didn't do the music. There you go. Death Count. Uh, and then we uh, we we have the Omega fly them to an intermediate planet that nobody yep. knows about. A space in the middle, a bridge, as it were. And uh, Crosshair is all nervous, like, <laughs> and she's like, "They'll be there." <laughs> like, come on. And, and they are and they are and it's um the hugs are really satisfying and seeing her kind of come home to the ship etc and wrecker and hunter's faces and then crosshair comes down the ramp uh, and, and we are with left nothing with nothing and i i was on the edge of my seat oh i mean i, I had to get up to go lay down because I wasn't feeling well. You're right. <laughs> but I was on the edge of my seat. A little glimpse into the Gould household last really, week. <laughs> really wanting to know the next episode. Right. I wanted that to start scene. right from there. I thought that would was what would happen. And then it didn't. It didn't. And I understand logistically hard to do. Also, a whole week will has passed. So the Piv- that momentous moment the all the lead up that we get from that with them on the ship crosshairs nervousness uh, uh, omega's consoling mm-hmm. quality the light the way he comes down the stairs the way they all stare stand there looking at each other with very neutral expressions on their face if we start with that a whole week later we're not giving th- like there's too much air that's had time to no, breathe. No, you're right. Yeah, you're so right. So we can't yeah. start there yeah. for the next episode. But before we move into the next episode, would you like to know someone who's connected to the production team? Um, part of this episode for this last this uh this a different approach. Yes. Okay. So it was directed by Saul Ruiz, who I've talked about before. It was written by Ezra Nachman. This is his second episode of writing a bad batch episode, Ooh. which great work. Congrats, Ezra. Ezra. Like you write, you wrote some great characters. Um, yeah. Really enjoyed the characters in this. Commander episode. Scorch. God, we won't be forgetting you. But, You're the sheriff of Nottingham of this planet. But the person I want to talk about is Andre Kirk. Okay. And Andre Kirk is the art director Ooh. for the Bad Batch. Ooh. Um, previously a design and concept artist on The Clone Wars, moved to concept designer in Rebels, and then senior concept designer in Resistance, now the art director for Bad Batch and Tales of the Jedi. There is an amazing, great article about Andre Kirk on StarWars.com. And Andre Kirk, as the art director for The Bad Batch, this all leads right into the next episode, um is definitely some of the inspiration behind Pabu, the planet that has this single island with a lighthouse on top. There's a great interview, uh, in the great interview that I read on the StarWars.com about season two and the pandemic, he mm-hmm. talks about and he says about Pabu, it was this Santorini-inspired island location. We wanted to evoke a feeling of family, of community, mm. of togetherness, and an idyllic vacation location that you can be that you can't be at right now because we're all trapped at home it's where clone force 99 can finally make a home and we all really wanted to go there oh we've often talked about how uh pabu is uh what is considered to be in the journey of the bad batch the lap of the goddess it's where they go to rest and that fits the description perfectly right like it's like the paradise or like the the place where they go to rejuvenate and rest. And it, it is considered to be an underworld in a situation in that they kind of are able to heal in, in a softer, gentler way. Yeah. In yeah. the way Phil Coulson's Tahiti wasn't. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh it's uh it's sort of like um Circe's Island in a way. Uh from an odyssey perspective it's cons- but you're all pigs <laughs> i mean no no but but in that like it 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 is a place where you technically rest for a while like right. yeah. yeah it is yeah. it is that moment of respite from one journey to the next exactly um, yeah and we are essentially one third of the way through the season with the end of return the return here wow so it makes and brings us great sense to take us and give us a respite moment as we kick off the return. 
I have a mini thought that is unrelated to anything whatsoever to do with a bad batch that I need to get out of me. And I don't know if I've said it before on the podcast, so I apologize if I have. But do you ever just think about how Echo Base might be named after Echo and what that means? Um, I've never. What's Echo Base? It's the snow base in Empire Strikes Back. On Hoth? Yeah. The name of the base is called Echo Base. And what if it's named after Echo? And they've been doing this to us the whole time. And then I'm like sad now. (laughs) Well, just because he's a base named after him doesn't mean he's gone. Sure. Why would he need to be gone? Like this could be called his base because he's the one who built and went there and generated it and started it. I mean, he's obviously already part of the rebellion because Rex is. But like, I'm just like, oh, my God, maybe they named Echo Base after Echo. That's really good. I love that. Yeah. Yep. It's been I've been thinking about it for a it while. It really ties into the fact that we just we're now going to a Hoth base and Echo is there. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, this is Hoth. This I, is a tiny I sort of, base. I thought it was Hoth for like two seconds, but right? then I remembered what this planet okay, was. Okay, and I will also tell you, I thought it was Hoth and I thought that was an Imperial probe droid. Oh, that was like buried? I thought those were Im- buried Imperial oh. probe droids. So I was exceptionally confused today. It was just, it was just for two seconds because I remember the planet that crosshair goes through his big like emotional symbolic transformation with mayday um but uh yeah and so with a week off <coughs> and so with a week off i was really i was really happy with how this episode began like mm. i got the warm fuzzies seeing omega in her new outfit curled up with her stuffy that meant a lot to me that she was safe and protected yeah and home quote unquote absolutely yeah i i really thought like especially since they decided to do the continuous conflict with an uneasy acceptance of crosshair being there i thought that was really good i just love how um you know crosshair is shaky like his hand is shaky just like the relationship between the brothers Mm -hmm. and uh omega easily bridges between them and reminds all of them (laughs) And across her, especially, she's older than him. Yes. That's important <laughs> that we need to remember that yeah. this season because she's going to take a firmer stand as the leader, as the str- strategist as the strategist, as the tactician. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I really tried to say strategist and tactician at the same time. That was a hard word to try to Strad- formulate. Strategi- Stractician. Stractician. So, nonetheless. <laughs> Even though we get the yeah. sense of the warm fuzzies with her and her stuffy and being home. And as soon as Wrecker and Hunter are there, oh, you're awake. It's so nice to see you. She's like, I don't care about you. Where's Crosshair? Right. Because I know the two of you are fine. He needs tending to. Yeah. And they almost seem to think like she needs support. But she's like, no, nah, exactly. I'm like, I'm the big sister. Remember? <laughs> yeah. Because she was taken from them. Right. Crosshair left by choice. Right. So they don't see th- the difficulty that he's in that yeah. he is in. They see that she needs consoling and comforting because she's finally back to them. It comes it comes around really, really well in this episode. Mm-hmm. When the fight then happens between Hunter and Crosshair that's been basically brewing, brewing for yeah. three seasons. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But we, we're not there yet. Because yeah. the first thing we get is no one talking about tech. Yeah. How does Crosshair even know tech is gone and dead, a quote unquote? I think they probably told him. When? I, they why, didn't, why didn't we get to see that? I'm sure. Oh, um, oh, did Omega know? I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Right? Omega was there. So wh- why doesn't tapped. Tech know? Or sorry, why doesn't Crosshair know? I mean, he or knows. if he does know, why doesn't it? Why doesn't it get brought up at all? Why is it immediately it's only, dismissed? It's only Echo that brings him up this episode. Which this would be so much easier if we had Tech. And then one second of silence before we move on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How dare you? We haven't had enough catharsis. I feel like so that means to me he's not dead, right? If we're not allowed to grieve for tech because we are not allowed to watch the characters grieve for tech no nope. then there must be a reason for that and it can't be because we have to get back to the plot because there's yet another giant monster they have to fight <laughs> so many giant monsters like wrecker even comments on it. i know it's great <laughs> uh, anyways uh so they they need to get the data off the data pad yes and so they call in their good buddy echo he shows up 
Although when they find out that they need to get the data off this data pad, mm-hmm. they can h- hack it into something. I just want to say, I too would like to sit in wicker chairs at a beautiful wooden right? table uh, while the Mexican sun sets behind me <laughs> and talk about an iPad that's not working very well. Because that feels very real for a vacation moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I just would like to be there with them. It it just felt so real. Like it was yeah. just And it, it's like it's Echo and Omega that are like, "Yes, but all of our family is in prisons." Yes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's always them. It's always them. It's always them and they're like, "We could just stay here and just relax and like not yeah. think about the world." And Omega and Echo are like, Yes, but don't you understand all of the others? They're like very, uh, what is it? Uh, bodhisattvas who cannot leave the world because everyone is still suffering. And so they have to be the last to leave. Yes. Like they're very like, they need to, well, they need to save everybody. They're also the ones that w- were experiments. Yes, right? exactly. These, yeah. these two in a special, Echo and Omega, have a closer connection to the inner workings and the diabolical machinations of the Empire right. in a way that the others don't because they were created with a purpose and sent out to partake and make use of it. The other two were not given that freedom. Right, exactly. <laughs> of, of Freedom Force 99. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it was interesting. The musical stinger of Echo's arrival was really big, brassy, major chords, like the arrival of a general, general someone important mm-hmm. is coming. But Rex isn't there. Literally, the only person who steps off the ship is Echo. We don't see Rex Echo base, all. I'm telling you. So we're wondering, does did Rex even come? Was Echo on his own the entire time? Mm, I think he was, yeah. Yeah, yeah I yeah, think yeah. so too. Um, they return to, they make the plan to go to this planet that... Uh, well, even that, before that, oh, Crosshair. I, I So, yeah, I, I really want to tie into the Echo's arrival is a really important one because the other two are comfortable and familiar with him. Right. right? Wrecker and Hunter are. Crosshair's line to te- to Echo is, what, no hug for me? Yeah. And immediately... Echo's response to that is intel, only if you've got good intel for us. In other words, this relationship is entirely transactional, right. and there is no sentimentality and feeling associated with this. But sentimentality and feeling is what Crosshair has learned over his time with the Empire, with mm-hmm, the other mm-hmm. clones, and the stormtroopers that he grew to connect with. And also his time like with Omega exactly. in, in the prison... Well, yeah, to a greater point, but he learned to be to develop sentimentality and care Mm -hmm. because he was with people. And now he's back with the people who called him brother and he's told, no, your relationship is entirely and only transactional. Yeah, exactly. As it was before. Yeah. And I talked about this in the first season with Crosshair that his relationship was always away from mm-hmm. the other three. He was always on a grassy knoll by himself, looking down a scope, waiting to pull the trigger. And that darkness that was constantly lo- lo- looming around him with the silence and emptiness that was with him, that pushed him right back into the Empire's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. bosom. Once he freed himself of it, he's trying to find his way back. And that's why we that's why he cannot shoot the gun. That's why his hand is shaking. That's why he's a 53% efficacy. Yeah. It's not because he cannot kill or he has yeah. he's lost the ability to do that. It's because he's grown to connect with people. Right. He he can't shoot people willy-nilly and just end lives like he like they don't matter anymore. Right. Lives matter to crosshair. Mm-hmm. Relationships matter to crosshair. And as a result, the people around him need to tell him that he matters. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we hear from Echo is only if you've got good intel for us. Oh, yeah, that's great. I love that. Yeah. Crushing moment for me. (laughs) Um, Because this and this episode is entirely about you've always struggled with crosshair. It's interesting. Yeah. And they've done a good job. They've had to, right? Because he is he's the redemption arc. Yeah. For us. This this story. Um, 
and we'll see things through his lens the entire time. In this episode, I think he's going to be if if Tech is alive and he's like turned or whatever, he'll be the one that turns tech back yeah if tech is turn a turn tech you could a, be a winter soldiered tech a tech a tech turntable <laughs> um uh so i want to talk about animals in this episode you i think you you had you'd mentioned something before we started about an animal that you want to talk about i don't want to talk about anything ben- beneath the surface right i want to talk about the bird the sort of albatross this is brought up i mean in that episode with that Crosshair kind of had his big moment of transformation. So it they land on the new planet where they go right there. There this is to Barton Four, which they've been before. Yes, New Hoth. They come to <laughs> New Old Hoth. New Old Hoth. Yeah. And the first thing Crosshair hears is a wheeling bird crying out above the yeah. the the, uh, the ship, and he looks up, and he's the only one who hears the bird, and he looks at it, and the bird looks at him. And winks knowingly, and I mean, then we move on, right? Like the the bird symbolically like covers him in a shadow in that episode and second season and stuff. Like it's and follows him. Like definitely, this is his his animal companion. Well, it's in a the way. albatross around his neck. Yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. is the lonely mariner, right? Oh, he, he is, is, yeah. Like, there is so much. And I was, I literally, I'm like, is this the albatross that Crosshair wears around his neck? Is this his curse? Like, is that what we're getting to? Because they tell us very clearly. It is. Well, the bird cries out three times. Yeah. The first time upon the arrival of Newhoth in this, right before the fight with Hunter. Yeah. The bird cries out and is literally landed on the sensors so that we get to see that everything's coming to a head. It's all landed. It's now it's on the surface. And then at the very end of the episode, as they're about to get on the ship, the bird cries out as it flies away Mm -hmm. and Crosshair's about to get back on the ship as though he's finally let the albatross go uh, and freed himself from the curse of uncaring. Yeah. So... I wrote it down that the albatross is the key to understanding the symbolic transformation that Crosshair went through. (laughs) Yeah. And that like, you know, he's no longer alone, which is so good. We see more of kind of the symbolism as they enter the base. You know, Batcher does his digging thing, which is there's so much digging that has to happen in this episode. We have to unearth our feelings. Unearth it. You have to pick at the scabs so that you can finally heal and stuff like that. Although really don't pick at your scabs. Don't don't pick up the scabs. But (laughs) in the base, like Hunter's kind of like watching him, looking at him like suspiciously. And he literally goes in and arranges Mayday's helmet, the bandaged one, and all of these other like clone trooper um, um, helmets so that they're like respectful because it's, it's a form of arranging the bones or like respectfully treating the fallen comrades. But this is symbolically arranging your own like broken self, your own skeleton so that you can heal uh, and get yourself in order for rebirth. And this is what's happening. Yeah. He's, he's, he's trying to come back to the land of the living. He's trying to come back to the, to the batch. Yeah. So Hunter and Wrecker head off. Sorry. So then Crosshair and Hunter argue uh, and head off to go do a scout of the perimeter or whatnot, right? When that's when right. this starts to think. And all the other stuff between Omega and Echo mm-hmm. and Wrecker is all interesting. Mm-hmm. But not nearly as important as the conflict. But all it does is serve as ways to bounce off the tension right. and come back to the tension that's going on. Right. Hence why... <laughs> Wrecker has to um Wrecker has to play with the breaker. Right. Which is just the funniest thing ever. <laughs> he has to uh offset the breaker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which so he basically doesn't break anything. He puts the breaker back into the on position and then goes back to doing everything else. Yeah. Wrecker doesn't actually break anything in this entire episode. It's weird. <laughs> it's weird. He just fixes something. Okay, let's talk about the worm attack. Sure. Before the worm attack, Crosshair and Hunter have finally started to get things off their chest. Right. They're they're arguing to the greatest of their their intent. But obviously, 
even bigger emotion is lurking beneath the surface. Exactly. Neither of them are saying how they really feel. Absolutely. And because neither character is capable or strong enough or in touch with themselves enough, Hunter included in this. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The plot, this the world, the, the world story. Says, hey, you have something that you need to pay attention to, and it's a giant worm. Right. I love that they actually call it a literal worm. A worm because with why? Because yeah. okay, so I've often while watching these episodes and the Bad Batch in general, I'm like, somebody writing this show has read the same books as me. Because um, from a Jungian perspective, from a Joseph Campbell perspective, from a symbolic perspective, dragons and snakes, especially serpents, are often used in mythology and dreams as impersonal spirits of the unconscious that demand to be confronted and thus will erupt into view to be fought. Yes, together. Together, right? And and. Uh, the worm, especially like German gun, um, the world snake is incomplete unless it is eating its own tail. That's the Ouroboros. That it means that you're in an alchemical union. You're in a um balanced cycle of death and rebirth. If you are not eating your own tail as a serpent, like this one, it means that you're in a consumption and destruction phase. And so the the fight between the brothers is not being truthful to what is really happening and they need to resolve it by working together which is a form of alchemical union also the symbol of the snake eating its own tail and thus they are able to create a ring around the fortress and reject the serpent to go off and be away yes it's it's sort of wild that this symbolism is so apparent and they bring up giant monsters like you said wrecker points out as a symbol as a big symbol within the story to represent the conflict (laughs) between the emotional conflict and uh but i find it very funny that like a worm specifically is one of the most common symbols in mythology and in like dream interpretation of something left unsaid that you need to fight and resolve And in doing that, they can finally recognize how important they are to each other. Yeah. And come back together and both be hugged by Wrecker. Yes, I love that. They cannot hug each other. They have to be hugged by Wrecker. They have to be hugged by Wrecker. They they have to have a buffer. (laughs) A Wrecker buffer. (laughs) Therefore, they have hugged each other in canon because that's the only way it can occur. Um, I did really love Hunter's line. Like, Like, Hunter himself is like, I'm not perfect either, which is really, really right. important. Well, it's really relevant too because he doesn't sense his surroundings. Mm. He's the one that needs to be saved. Mm-hmm. He's the one that falls in the hole. Crosshair's the one who pulls him out. Yeah. And that trust that's built with that too. Yeah. When has that ever happened? I know. When has Hunter ever been the it's one? Because. It's because was they're not, off balance without each other. Or they are put off balance by their feelings that yeah. they have not, that they have too long repressed mm-hmm. about each other. And that is important. Hunter is not aware of his surroundings and the monster. The monster erupts and shocks Hunter. He only recognizes <laughs> it the bravest moment before too it occurs. distracted. <laughs> and then he falls in the hole and has to be saved. Yeah. I, so he says, I have regrets to Crosshair. All we can do is keep trying to be better and there might be hope for us yet. Yeah. I love Star Wars is about redemption. Yeah. And it's a, it's the thing I always say. And, and I've been thinking about this all day. Bad Batch shows what I talk about on What the Force so well. It's really easy to point out, look, here's this anti-patriarchal redemption story about giving up violence And yet look at all of these cool mythological symbols that are also integrated into the story. And it makes me really happy to cover this show with you and to talk about it and let like, you know, everybody who's listening join in on the conversation because I think it's just a brilliant show. And if you didn't think that this episode wasn't about digging up your trauma and and (laughs) seeking from the heart, both, both Crosshair and hunter at the end of the episode are carrying shovels 
Oh, really? Yes. Where did they get the shovels? Probably from, you know, the snow base that they had to dig (laughs) out. There's all this digging and undigging and and burying, burying the hatchet and burying past conflict. Right. Has been done because they're carrying the shovels they used to do it. Right. (laughs) That's great. Isn't that hilarious? That's funny. Yeah. Because they didn't have any shovels before. No. (laughs) They only had Batcher, which is Omega, as we talked about. Yeah. They're Uh, finishing up. They're getting back on their their plane to fly away. And they both have have shovels. They had to dig out the ship, right? Like that was part of it because it was, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was, (laughs) that's great. Um, I really, I really enjoyed these episodes. I thought they were really neat and showed different, you know, kind of like, I, I love a good giant Star Wars monster. Oh, absolutely. This one was directed by Nathaniel Villanueva, who mm-hmm, was the mm-hmm. previous director. He's directed a whole bunch of Bad Batch in season two and season one. But he also directed episode two, uh, Paths Unknown of this season. Oh, interesting. Season. Okay. Yet another monster Right. Episode. Yeah. So that's quite interesting that he keeps getting ta- tagged <laughs> and tapped to direct it's a mo- these a giant monsters. monster and the chasing and the running aways. That I want. He's I want directing. records quote on a T-shirt. <laughs> but I want to point out that this episode was written by Amanda Rose Munoz, who, and this is her fifth episode oh. for the Bad Batch. And I would say this is one of my favorites because. While it does seem like an innocuous episode and like, oh, they went there to, to figure out what was going on with this data pad. That data pad was completely irrelevant. Nothing about that data pad was important. Well, I've, I have thoughts whatsoever. on that, though. But, but because the heart of this episode was the rapprochement between Hunter and Crosshair and returning Crosshair to the group. Right. Yeah. That's what that's what this episode is about. The meat of this episode is about that relationship being repaired. And while, yes, there's a data pad and data and echo and meta plot. But I got to talk to you about what it represents. Sure. It is an underworld motif that they dig in and they have to go in to try and find this sort of thing that can rescue the community. Right. Right. But in the end, the thing that's going to rescue the community is the bond between the bar- brothers. That's that's the elixir that they find on this base is the is the healing and the redemption and the hope in each other. Exactly. And yeah, that's the thing. This the that's the like supposed like treasure that they're supposed to be going after. But the treasure is within us the whole time. And that's so Joseph Campbell. It's yeah. it like the snake like Sigmund. Uh, Siegfried, sorry, Siegfried fights the dragon in the cave and drinks of the blood because he now has understood his own darkness and is better because of it. And we often think we're going to go and find a treasure and end up finding a different treasure within ourselves. It is amazing how little of an adventure Wrecker and Hunter have truly been on. Yeah. And just the general lack of growth for both of those unfortunate characters. Like neither of them have had much opportunity to truly grow beyond the scope of what they were made for. Right. I mean, Hunter basically just accepted like, I'm going to be Omega's primary protector. Yep. And uh, Wrecker's like, and I'm going to be Omega's best friend. Yeah. Big brother. <laughs> I break stuff and I hug. Yeah. So, but we've watched as Wrecker's I still, minor development is that yeah. he hugs the people and, and can maintains the bond of friendship and brotherhood. Uh, but nonetheless, the uh, the bird has cried and flown off for the third time. And, and, uh, and yeah. thus they are healed. Yeah. And I'm looking forward. We have names for all of the other episodes now on Ooh, IMDb. Yeah. That's interesting. No details, but all of the episodes have been named. This is very different from the first season of The Bad Batch, where all we got was numbers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, uh, can we name an episode, please, people? Um, but to that end, there's always somebody I like to talk about. And so for this episode, yeah. Uh, would you like to know who Danica Gernhardt is? Sure. Okay. So Danica Gernhardt is the finance manager. <laughs> Okay, we're dealing with the accountants, the 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 bean counters. She is a professional accountant. Correct. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's funny that because she's titled that in the credits for right. the episode, but her actual role with Lucasfilm 
on according to LinkedIn is animation finance manager. So she is responsible for the f- the management of the finances for all of Lucasfilm she animation. She gets the change group. requests. Yes. Um, <laughs> she got her start, it looks like, with, get this, Lego Star Wars. Nice. She had been doing accountant-related components for other productions and movies and whatnot, like Kubo and the Two Strings sort mm-hmm, of thing, mm-hmm. I believe. I'm, I'm just quoting that off the top of my head. Uh, but she has been the finance manager for The Bad Batch for 37 episodes. So all of the episodes to date. And yep. she's in charge of the day-to-day management of the production finance and has overall accountability for reporting, including the revenue recognition, mm-hmm. the accruals, production accounting, and analysis. Her She reports directly to the director of TV content finance at mm. Lucasfilm. And her role is essentially payroll and approvals and budget related mm-hmm. concerns and so she's probably talking to a lot of line producers and um pipeline individuals yeah principally but then she also it has oversight and probably has to sit in on a lot of meetings between creative heads as they lay out what they're going to expenditure their budget for for each particular episode so she's a very interesting person who has a great huge background in accounting and yet has this wonderful connection to this creative world of tv development and so i just like to what's your accounting software lucasfilm right i don't know (laughs) what they use i don't know what they use for these sorts of budgetary controls and whatnot to uh, to put these things through and and whatnot are they an sap house (laughs) but again right it's interesting to see how you don't have to be a writer or an actor mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or uh, an or an animator to be involved in the creative impetus of yeah. art. You can still be connected to an to art in general through accounting, through mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know budget control, through um, pipeline management, and through like the legal side, which I talked about mm-hmm. the last time I was on. There's lots of different ways to get involved with the creative component that is a animated cartoon show on TV. Yeah. There's lots of big adult shoe roles that are needed mm-hmm. that people can find a home in and make good money doing to help make this art occur. And that's kind of cool too, because she seems like such a really neat and interesting human being who's found a way to use a skill set and an aptitude that she has in a way that creates beautiful art that has awesome repercussions and memories and teaches you something. And make sure that they're on budget. Exactly. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much, Kyle. I feel like I learned something every time we record. Really? Oh, well, it's so much fun to sit down and chat with you about this. I am so looking forward to the next series of episodes to come from this season because it is the final season. It also Mm -hmm. feels like they want to very clearly tell us something. Mm -hmm, And we're starting mm -hmm. to see that percolate to the surface um, from all this snow. Yes. (laughs) Well, I believe we will be back next week because there's it's a two episode week next Yay, week a two-parter two-parter so uh looking forward to that i don't know if it uh, it's two-parter or they're just releasing two episodes at once but uh that's what they did a little bit last season was like two episodes in these chunks but uh we will definitely record those two episodes because i think that kind of two episode chunks seems to be working for us absolutely and yeah i'll say it now mm-hmm I can't wait to see what this group does. They have built such a strong, skilled, capable, well run animation team yeah. over there that I cannot wait to see what Jennifer Corbett and everybody underneath her is working on to come next. Because like what the animation, the next generation animation right? will be. Because like they, they, be? they were, a lot of them were from Resistance. And before. And then, yeah and before and like rebels and uh, rebels resistance and then you know the kind of the uh tales, tales of, of the, the jedi, jedi and yeah. all other components there i'm very interested mm-hmm. in seeing because they're done yeah like everybody i've talked about all the directors and the writers and the producers and the line managers and the accountants they've been done for a while they've been done for a mm-hmm. while which means whatever because the last thing is like final mix and sound and and things like that and it that was probably done maybe six months ago speaking from experience 
the writing and the creative iteration Mm -hmm. happens first. Yep. You only get the finished product when the finished product is done. And that pipeline is long for a thing like this. Yeah. So what what is coming next has me excited. Yeah. And hopefully we find out uh I mean, I hope before Japan, but definitely in Japan. I I would hope that something will be at least teased at the conclusion of this. You think so? I would hope that they would want to Mm. They wouldn't want a delay and a lag to occur in betwixt this. I want I want them to be brave. I want them to go to a new era. Yeah. That would be amazing if they went to like before the High Republic or like the Mandalorian Jedi Wars, but in cartoon form to lay the groundwork for it. Because as much as I love the books for, you know, kind of opening up the world for the High Republic, I think that animation is a better choice as a breakthrough to it, a new age. Absolutely. Of Star Wars. And I and I couldn't see a better one than post Kylo Ren and post Rey. Like way further out. 20 years past that. Mm. What, what, that'll, that's untested ground. That's the new frontier. But they could go way back in the past too. And that would be cool. Like you still can't blow up the universe in the same way that you could with a new. You can't blow up the universe anytime. (laughs) I, it would be cool. It would be cool to go forward because then like you know things survive or even further i think that even going way further in the future is also an option yeah because then like you could build a whole new world kind of thing and everything that they deal with now is legends Who knows? maybe daisy ridley is coming back because she's going to be the principal lead in the animated adventures of ray starting her own school and that's what we're getting next who knows <laughs> It could be anything, but this has been Idle Conjecture with Kyle and Marie Claire. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I do. I hope that they're all working on something cool from an animation perspective. Well, we are blessed to have 10 more episodes of this show left. Yes. And I can't wait to share my thoughts with you and with everyone listening. And we'll enjoy them. Cheers. <laughs>